Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Schwartz, a member of the Board of Directors of Impact Israel, and I am thrilled to welcome you to today's panel, featuring a cross-section of the best and brightest from Israel's high-tech innovation ecosystem. This is the first in a new series of interactive forums Israel, Impact Israel will be hosting with an intention to bring you compelling and relevant content for today's environment. And speaking of relevant, innovation and creativity have a critical role to play in driving economic growth and vitality. At a time when Israel, the US, and so many other countries are experiencing pandemic-driven record unemployment, our panelists are playing a major role, hoping to dig us all out of the hole we're in. In a similar way, and through their own ingenuity, Impact Israel and our Israeli partners are elevating education and opportunities for at-risk youth in Israel. These teens, an estimated 400,000 across the country, find themselves in their own hole, and we play a leading role in lifting up their lives and helping them steer a path for success. I know we're all excited to hear from this amazing panel and in just a few minutes, we'll turn things over to our moderator, who will introduce the rest of our special guests. But first, I'd like to share a brief three minute video about Impact Israel's Israeli partners, who are taking the country's most vulnerable youth and helping them grow from survival to leadership. Just before that, I wanted to mention, if there's something you really like about today's program, or you have ideas for a future panel, Send your feedback our way through the Q&A function in the Zoom app, and we'll do our best to consider it as we move forward. And with that, we'll cue the video. In the era of the global village, a school or any educational environment must represent the old village of humanity where the values were clear, where everybody is there for each other, where they can find out who they are, what their strengths are, crystallizing a healthy personality. The Village Way is a methodology which creates that environment and it is applicable in every young human soul. If I had to sum up the Village Way, simply and quickly, I would say it's a method that can be used by any educator in order to provide the adolescent with the tools and responsibility to rightly choose his path for life. We realize the magic that happened in Yeminot is still happening, but it's much bigger than that now. If we want to impact Israel and change our society, we have the know-how, we have the educational methodology to make a difference, and it's happening now. After many years of experience in the high ranks of the Israeli national security, I know for sure that the ability to evolve as a nation and to maintain our moral compass depends on the quality of our education. We have established the Village Way in 2006, and the idea behind it was to actually try to change the Israeli society. We believe in the power of educators. Educators are nation builders. You know, the Village Way philosophy got something right. And I'm a great example of that. I came to Israel from Ethiopia when I was uh, eight and arrived at Yamin Ort in ninth grade. The boy with no dream is a survivor. He sees only his, you know, day to day. What I'm doing today, compared to where I was then, it's been a very long way for me. From a shy boy suddenly to student council elections, and I won. And then you actually lead a community. You take responsibility. And naturally, it then affects your military service. I've been a squad commander, then officer, and went on to earn a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And that's what makes you. This is what I chose to do what I think is the right thing, to really influence people, to open a branch of Yamin Ord's pre-military program, for which I act as manager today. The simple principles born in Yamin Ord with at-risk youth now reach thousands of young boys and girls all over Israel, including soldiers, police officers, and others. 
it evolved way beyond our expectations. The impact is dramatic. I believe that the great aspiration of doing good here in this place that is now spreading throughout the country has meaning far beyond what you see here and what we have done already. We still have a way to go. Well, I tell you, uh, we launched that video several months ago. I've seen it probably 50 times at this point, and I never get tired of watching it. I feel like it sums up perfectly the power of the Village Way and, and what we're all about here. Um, I just want to mention real quick, if you have questions, in addition to the feedback, if you have questions for today's panelists, you can also use the Q&A function in Zoom to pose those questions, and we'll do our best um, to call those, and uh, we're, we're going to have a Q&A session a little bit later in the program. But now it's my pleasure to introduce our host for today's panel, Jonathan Elkins. Jonathan made Aliyah in 1991 after earning degrees at the University of Pennsylvania and Brandeis University, and served as the news anchor for the Israel Broadcasting Agency's nightly English language broadcast. After leaving IBA, Jonathan co-founded Headline Media, the leading strategic communications firm in Tel Aviv. Headline's clients include many of Israel's best known startups, including Wix, Checkpoint, Fandom, Lemonade, Flytrex, and many others, as well as the famed Maccabi Tel Aviv, Israel government agencies, and Microsoft. John, take it away. Thank you so much, Eric. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, again, a reminder that after our panel discussion is done, uh, we're going to be taking questions from the crowd. So please send in any questions you have via the um, Zoom Q&A feature, and I'll try to ask as many of them as I possibly can. And if you'd like, please include your name and where you're from. I want to start today's discussion with a brief story. Not so many people actually know this, but Israel once made its own cars in the 60s and early 70s. They were called the Susida, which means little horse in Hebrew. The problem was the chassis was made out of fiberglass. And according to folklore, camels who apparently love fiberglass would often gnaw on the cars themselves, which explains why these automobiles were often found without chunks of their exterior. Well, the Israeli automotive technology industry has come a long way since then, as testified by the sale of Waze to Google for a billion dollars and of Mobileye to Intel for over $15 billion, and by the hundreds of mobility startups in the country poised to become the next big unicorns. Today's panelists are going to talk about the state of Israeli mobility technology, as well as Israeli innovation in general, and where we can expect to see both moving down the road. So without further ado, let's welcome our panelists. Yariv Bash is the co-founder and CEO of Flytrex Aviation. Flytrex provides on-demand drone delivery solutions for the food and retail sectors, and was the first company in the world to deploy a drone delivery system to people's backyards in an urban environment above Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. Prior to that, Bash was the co-founder and the first CEO of Space IL, a $100 million Israeli nonprofit that attempted to land Brashit, the first private interplanetary robotic mission on the moon, making Israel only the seventh nation ever to orbit the moon and reach the lunar surface. Yari, welcome. Yafaron is the co-founder and CEO of Leumitech, Bank Leumi Group's high-tech banking arm. Aron has established Leumitech as the leading banking platform for Israel's technology sector. Under her leadership, Leumitech has developed strong ties with leading venture capital firms, investors, and other key players in the Israeli tech ecosystem to support both startups and growth companies with all of their financing needs. Yifat, thanks so much for joining us today. 
And Michael Granoff is founder and managing director of Maneev Mobility, a venture capital fund based in Tel Aviv, which invests globally in startup companies at the intersection of transportation and technology. Founded in 2015, Maneev has raised two funds and is roughly $145 million under management. The Maneev portfolio includes nearly 30 mobility startups. Michael, great to have you here. Good to be with you. Start with you. Um, your portfolio at Maneve includes companies developing everything from self driving cars to automotive cybersecurity to shared moped platforms. As someone with his ear very close to the pavement, how, in your mind, the changes brought about by the current pandemic transformed mobility in 2020? Thanks, John. It's a great question. It's one a lot of people are, are thinking about. We've felt uh, for a long time now that um, the um, there was a lot of emphasis over the last few years on autonomous vehicles, and, and people began to think really that we were moving from a world of manually driven cars to self-driving cars, and that that was what new mobility was all about. But what we saw was something slightly different, which is that um, kind of in uh, yet this 100-year period, 1908, began the uh, auto industry with the Model T, uh, with Henry Ford developing a system to be able to make cars affordable to the masses. And in the, exactly 100 years later, in 2008, um, people could think, well, we had the financial crisis, we had the bankruptcy of some large automakers, but there's something else that happened without us noticing at the time, which was the invention of third-party apps on smartphones, which really I think launched the next epoch in mobility, which is the uh, era of digital mobility. And uh, so, in in uh, in, we, so we have felt actually for a while that the theme is diversity. It's not about buying vehicles as much as it's about buying trips in in the future. And that trip might be in an Uber, uh, or it might be in, in a on, a on a shared moped, or 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 an electric bicycle, or a scooter. Um, or some other means that you can, uh, you can uh, hail from your smartphone. What hasn't caught up is urban infrastructure. And that's what the kind of shoe that we were waiting to drop even before this pandemic began. And we began to see in some places like Paris, uh, a lot of efforts being made to change uh, some of the infrastructure. Sometimes it just involves painting the roads differently to make it more accessible to these uh, new lighter weight vehicles that are either manually powered or electric powered. And uh, I, I often said, I thought if Mike Bloomberg was still mayor of New York, he would already have an Uptown Avenue, a Downtown Avenue that was designated just for uh, micro mobility and self-powered vehicles. What the pandemic has done actually is, as with many things, it sped things up in that direction. It began because, you know, people were driving anywhere, but they wanted to get out of their homes to be able to walk and they needed the space. And so city said, okay, we'll make these streets available for pedestrians, for bicyclists. And people are discovering, gee, we've been giving all this space to cars and cities for so long, we forgot there was another thing you could do. And, and, and they really enjoy having the space. So I think we're gonna see it uh, continue. How do you see cities themselves being tra transformed by these changes in mobility? Yes, absolutely. I think that the thing to watch over these next few years is uh, how uh, the public and policymakers uh, interact in um, changing uh, cities to be less car centric and to have a, a, a greater diversity of lighter weight uh, electric and manually powered vehicles. Michael, they say that disruption leads to disorientation often. Do we have any reason to be apprehensive about the changes you've been describing? Um, in, in these terms, I think we have a little reason to be apprehensive, except I would say that uh, there's one great assumption underlying all of this, which the, the, the pandemic has brought into uh, some question in some quarters, and that has to do with urbanization. Urbanization is something we all know has been a, a really universal trend. You know, you see, obviously see in, in, in China and in the East, and, and you see it in, 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 in Europe and the U.S., and and even in Israel, where I, I think uh, policymakers tried very hard to uh, uh, encourage young people to establish communities in the Galil and, and, and uh, in the Negev. And in fact, it didn't matter how little they built, how much prices went up, people found a way to be in the Mirkaz, in the center of the country. And I think they just gave up on that and said, okay, that's how it's going to be. 
But um, this now people uh, are saying, uh, because if, uh, I'm sure lots of people on this call have had the experience I've had, which is that anybody who you're Zooming with from New York is not in New York. <laughs> they're in a suburb or they're uh, in, in some other far-flung location. And some of them are saying, you know, when will I go back or will I go back at all? And there's been a lot of debate uh, about, uh, you know, whether the, the, the advent of bandwidth at this level means that New York won't come back because people don't have an incentive to be, uh, to be back in, in crowded space and offices. I happen to think it's way too early to say that, uh, you know, six months of a, of a pandemic is going to change uh, decades of a trend towards urbanization. And as long as um, people do want to live more densely, and I think that is the, the overarching trend, we have to think about transportation differently. And everybody can't have cars. Uh, just there's no there's no space for it. It's in, it becomes the least convenient way of getting around. And so that's why I think these changes are, are very positive. You're, you're on mute. You're on mute. Huh? Thank you. Um, I'm going to start our discussion uh, by telling everyone actually how we met. It was about 10 years ago that I happened to hear a story about three good friends who met in a bar. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it, this is actually a true story. Well, after a few beers, they come up with a plan, as one will after a few beers. And the plan is to build a rocket ship to send to the moon to win the $30 million Google Lunar X prize. Now, all of us have come up with plenty of great ideas we've written down on a cocktail napkin, but the difference is these guys made good on it and actually sent a rocket to the moon. After hearing that story, I said, I have got to meet these lunatics, and I did, and I've been working with the CEO of the project, Yareem, ever since. So we'll hear a little later about Yareem's moonshot, but I want to start with something equally ambitious, which is your drone delivery company, Flytrex, which just this month formed a groundbreaking partnership with Walmart, providing drone deliveries of Walmart goods to people's backyards in North Carolina. Yareem, I know you can't really discuss the specifics of the Walmart deal, but tell us in general about your drone delivery model. Uh, sure. So basically, Flytrex Aviation is a, a drone delivery company. Uh, we focus on food and retail to people's backyards. And basically, we're not talking about large toy drones. We are talking about smaller airplanes. Uh, we've been working together hand in hand with the FAA, with the Federal Aviation Administration, in the past three years to certify our system uh, to be incorporated in the national airspace in the U.S., and the uh, Walmart deal is just the, uh, the, really the, the start of that. We already have a few contracts uh, under NDA that have already been signed with, well, the, the, there's nothing like Walmart, but with similar companies. And we expect to start scaling uh, early next year. So uh, if you thought drone deliveries are the future, well, they're uh, just around the corner. Why, why is a drone delivery better than a scooter? delivering your food or a UPS van for that matter? Well, we're, we're cheaper, more affordable. We're quieter, we're safer. It's just a better way. The, uh, the skies are pretty, pretty available. We can really cruise through the skies at 60 miles per hour without any interference. There's no road signs, there's almost no traffic. And even if there is, the computers and algorithms just saw that out. And it's a lot more affordable. Uh, if you think about it, there's a one-ton car that's driving all the way to your house with a human inside to bring you your burrito. That, that's, that's crazy. Uh, instead, we our drones are a bit more than 30 pounds. And they just, you know, they're fully electric. They zip through the skies. They reach to your backyard, load the package from the sky. We don't land in your backyard. We just hover and lower it on a wire. And it's really a much better solution. I'm guessing that in a few years, you know, moving one ton from one place to the other in order to uh, deliver three pounds, that would sound just outrageous. Would you say the biggest challenge is towards making drone delivery the rule rather than the exception? And how do you, how do you overcome those? Well, it's, uh, it's regulations, regulations, and regulations. Uh, we, we started doing deliveries in Iceland, really flying above people, beyond visual line of sight, all the things that are still almost impossible to do in, in other places. Uh, 
uh, but it's a very long route from having the right technology to having the regulatory approval. And it's for a reason. Our skies today are, today are very safe, uh, and we'd like to keep it that way. So it's really a step-by-step -step approach, working with regulators all over the world, realizing that they have a very important job of keeping us all safe, both on the ground and in the air. And only once you get to the app, you know, you get the, the viewpoint of the regulators, you can start really working hand in hand with them on, on solving that problem. It, it's really, it's almost like you're getting an FDA approval for, your, for a new medicine. It's, I, I actually think there are more medical companies than, than there are aviation companies and, and for a reason. So I, let's say one morning I wake up, I can't find my toothbrush. Um, when, when, is it, when is it gonna happen that I can order that toothbrush in 15 minutes via drone? So if you by chance are currently living in Fayetteville, there's a chance that you can do that tomorrow morning. Uh, we're already serving a few uh, houses, select houses from the uh, nearest Walmart. Uh, and we expect to start expanding more rapidly early next year. Uh, basically, if you think about it, today when you're making your grocery list, you, you know, you, you're making your weekly list because it's, you either have to exit the house and go to a supermarket and start picking up all the items from the aisles, or you have to make an order that costs a lot of money to your house. But if we'll be able to offer you a, an Amazon Prime equivalent service where you, know, you don't pay anything for that specific delivery, if I need toothbrush for this morning or tomatoes for my dinner, I'll just order them with a drone and be almost instantly gratified with whatever I order. Thanks, Yariv. If I, I'm turning to you now, I want to zoom out a little bit, no pun intended. We're in the middle of a once-in-a-century crisis, but of course, as the saying goes, every crisis is also an opportunity. What sort of opportunities does the current health and economic crises present for Israeli innovation? Sure, John. So may, maybe I'll give you my two cents uh, with telling a story. So uh, as you all know, we were all uh, mandated to stay at home. Uh, I work for a bank. Our bank usually has probably 90, 95% of its people actually work from the office on office infrastructure. All of a sudden, we have a situation where we need to function. We're not a hospital, but we're a bank. We're supposed to provide services. And we work from home. We had to get uh, infrastructure. We had to get cyber uh, to make sure that cyber issues don't rise up. We had to have a trading room out of our homes, et cetera, et cetera. You can only imagine what happened. And we are one of many, you know, many corporates that dealt with very similar things where all of a sudden we became a virtual bank. Uh, almost overnight, we had to put together all kinds of systems, many of which are based on, on technologies, some Israeli, some are less. I'll give you another example. You know, if you look at specifically started with uh, Italy, unfortunately, the situation there was a dire, you know, very big dire straits there. And it, it happened in a way that pizza places had to ship pizzas, but they couldn't do it because none of them had actually websites. So all of a sudden, all these very small businesses around the world had to become digital uh, and virtual. And one of the companies that was benefiting from that specific trend is an Israeli company called Wix. It's a public company. And you can look back, you know, six months on the share price, you can see very clear, you know, uh, trends stemming from, from the pandemic. Another situation that, that can help, you know, answer this question is something that I was uh, viewing very uh, closely is what happened in the hospitals in Israel. Uh, you can imagine that, you know, a hospital and specifically Sheba Medical Center, which is the biggest in Israel, all of a sudden had patients that somebody needed to take care of, but they couldn't touch them because, uh, you know, it took a while until people actually got closer. So we had to, not we, but the, the hospital had to put together and they, they actually did uh, sort of a lab where they started adopting all kinds of technologies from based on Israeli startups, only Israeli startups, to have the virtual, you know, uh, uh, hospital. So how do you take a fever? How do you check pulse? How do you how do you monitor the lungs? 
all kinds of things that uh, all of a sudden you need to do remotely. Uh, obviously, we didn't have to do it until that point. Uh, and many companies, Israeli companies, that were doing things that were close to what was needed in COVID was actually being able to pivot very quickly. And I think Israelis are, are known for being able to come up with you know, very quick solutions to, to new problems. And they came up with a lab that was completely, you know, the, the doctors could be behind, uh, uh, behind a wall and, and treat the patients without actually getting closer. The, the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that, you know, obviously we're not, nobody's happy about the situation and, and the investment group, the investment ecosystem was very disturbed for about two, three, first of the two, three weeks of the crisis of, you know, what's going to happen and how companies are going to survive and who's going to invest in them, et cetera, et cetera. And very quickly, it was a very, uh, it was a very a obvious a notion that uh, specifically, the COVID or, or the COVID has actually extended the attractiveness or, or increased the attractiveness and the dependency on technology amongst everybody and every everything. Uh, and the, the good things, and, and I'm summing up what we've seen in Israel, is that after a few weeks of, of trying to, to, to understand what the situation is, and, and you know, everybody had, most of the investors were busy with their own portfolios, but very quickly, uh, we we've seen, and, and I think my colleagues will agree to that, we've seen a, a huge flow of money, uh, both money that was existing in, on, in Israeli uh, either funds or, or American funds that are here, but also from foreign investors that are just looking to invest in technology. And we've seen a spike in actually the pace of investment in, investments into uh, startups uh, in Israel, but not only in Israel because everybody understands what they understood before, but now it's even more magnified that, you know, everybody must innovate. Everybody must become more digital. Everybody must be more dependent on cloud, have more cyber protection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it has actually provided to most of the, most of the sectors within Israeli tech has actually, have actually benefited from uh, the crisis, obviously, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, uh, because the crisis is not a good thing, but for tech, it was uh, a very big boost. So whereas a lot of people were predicting that startups would be hard hit financially, you're not finding that to be the case. I, I think that, that it's, it's not as simple as that because it, there is a big uh, difference between those companies that have already established some kind of uh, product. Maybe they started you know, revenues and those with interesting uh, value proposition, uh, I think, found it uh, not easy, but you know, they, they can uh, get money. Uh, those who are uh, suffering are actually the, the earlier stages, those who don't have investors uh, yet. It's not as trivial to uh, get an investment uh, when you're so early in your, in your uh, you know, progress with, with somebody who cannot really sit down with you to diligence you, uh, you know, in one room, you know, Zoom as much as and now we're having the Zoom, it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, so not, it's not an easy, it's not an easy situation. And, and by the way, the government was very instrumental in that sense, because what they've done is very quickly adapted to the situation and started a uh, um, flow of funds through our uh, 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 innovation authority. Uh, teams that they've expedited the process of providing grants to startups uh, and they promise to do it in a very short timeline, which is up to four weeks, which is very, very short. Uh, and also they launched, which is, it's just been published literally in the last uh, half an hour, they launched a, a program to entice uh, institutional investors in Israel to invest money in tech with very nice uh, protection schemes on, on, on the money. Uh, and many of the Israeli institutional investors have actually bid to be in that program, and they just announced a three, I think, a three billion check in program. So, overall, I think coming from the private market and also the the government, I think we're okay. Still, the early stage startups are are having a little rougher time than what they did. You know, you're staying uh, on this on the topic of uh, the pandemic. Um, the, the economic and health crises have actually had an impact on the, the way that people see drone delivery 
Is that, is that not the case? Uh, so I have to say that people are, they don't really care. I mean, at the first uh, delivery or two, everybody's at the window looking at the drone, lowering the package. Uh, but by the third one, they just get a notification on their phone that the uh, drone left them the package in the backyard and they go up and pick it. Uh, they're of course a lot happier to get the uh, deliveries all the way to their homes, but it's, uh, it's not really about the pandemic, it's more about the, uh, you know, the user experience and the, uh, the comfort of the end user. Uh, having said that, I can also say that the, uh, while the FA isn't willing to lower the bar on safety or on you know, the regulatory framework, they are willing and are motivated to work a lot faster with you. So we've been, you know, we've been moving from a, a weekly conference call with the FAA to between three and four meetings on a weekly basis. That's uh, most of my nights in Israel are spent on a conf call with different FAA teams from different uh, branches in the US. So that, that really helps to speed up the process. You actually had an, an initiative where you were making deliveries to people who were sheltering at home, right? Yeah, correct. So, when COVID-19 started, we uh, deployed uh, uh, one of our stations in North Dakota together with the uh, Grand Forks uh, uh, test site. There's like a, a, a drone a test site located over there. And we actually started servicing people directly to their, to their homes. Uh, it's still running up there and running and it's been an amazing experience. People have been ordering blizzards from Dairy Queen, uh, Hamburgers from McDonald's using our system. It's uh, it's been a, you know, it's just growing. It's nice to see it happening. Amazing. Well, most of the news coming out of Israel these days doesn't really seem quite so happy. But I, want, I do want to shift to some good news coming out of Israel recently. You have returned from a business trip to the United Arab Emirates, which, as we know, not long ago signed a peace deal with Israel. What was your experience there and what kind of opportunities are you seeing opening up there for Israeli businesses? Yeah, I observed. Yes. Oh, Michael. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Was that for me or for? No, go ahead, go ahead. That was for you, Michael. You fight your next because you also will return from the business trip there too. But Michael, why don't you start? Who, who uh, six weeks ago, we would have said UAE. And now it's like, yeah, of course, we've both been there. But um, yeah, I mean, I observed that, uh, you know, in, in one of the, uh, the ironies of history, 2020, uh, you know, in, in Israeli history, maybe look back on it as really the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. I, I really uh, got that sense um, when uh, when I when I visited the, uh, Dubai a few weeks ago, uh, because it's not uh, it's not just that um, there's peace and not just that there's uh, diplomatic relations, uh, but there is a, an unbelievable hunger uh, that I found on the part of Emiratis to uh, really get to know Israel and uh, certainly to do business, but really I found it to be much deeper than that. Um, I'm on now several groups of Israel and Emirati um, participants that uh, all day long are chatting about all sorts of things. In the last few days, it was about one of the customs of Yom Kippur uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and the business opportunities are really unbelievable. We're actually in the, currently uh, doing diligence on a mobility company in the UAE. And uh, we also have lots of uh, Emirati investors that are interested in our companies, interested in uh, future funds. So, um, you know, I, I, I think um, as soon as we get past this COVID, um, the, uh, I, I would guess that there's gonna be a half dozen or more flights every day between uh, Tel Aviv and uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And uh, certainly uh, every Israeli will, will, will go there for, for vacation. There's no, that, that'll happen very, very quickly. But also there's gonna be an enormous amount of commerce between the countries. So it's, it's tremendously exciting on lots of levels. But you also returned, as we said, from a trip to the UAE. Yeah. You wrote an article saying there is a mutual interest for companies in both countries to forge partnerships. Is there, is there any special news you can share with us on the Israeli tech front? Yeah, so, so I have to say that I want to, first of all, I agree with Michael on everything, obviously, that you said, and I was uh, wondering if I got more excited and, and thrilled from the video that started this Zoom event or from, from the trip, so I think it's a good competition. <laughs> They're both very emotional to me. Um, yeah, it was, it was a huge, for me, it was huge, um, the fact that, that we're, we're 
doing peace, which, which supposedly is the first of many, many to come, uh, is, is really fascinating. I will, I will add a little bit to what Michael said. Um, I think that the opportunities, they vary across sectors, but if I look at uh, technology, what we were told that was uh, um, the government or, or whatever you want to call it, the, the president's vision is, first of all, they're trying for a while to divest away from oil. And they're doing everything they can to have oil as a very small part of the GDP. Um, even as much as you know, using clean energy and doing things that may, I, I don't even know if they're cheaper to them, probably not, sitting on all this oil, but they really want to divest away. And they're putting a lot of effort into few, few categories that are very relevant to Israeli companies. And I'll, I'll briefly say what they are. One is FinTech. They're very advanced. They're, I think Dubai is the 12th largest financial center in the world. The banks are extremely advanced, very digital, and they're, they want to adapt every single technology out there, including blockchain. I think Israeli entrepreneurs will find uh, the very low bureaucracy, very in, uh, good um, uh, regulation and, and uh, you know, supporting uh, stuff there to be a, a welcoming point for them to come and uh, sell their products. The other thing is around what they call food safety. Uh, apparently, uh, the Emirates are importing, I think it's 95% of their food and they want to become more independent in that sense. So they, they're looking to do things with food tech, agri-tech, all, all this front. Obviously, water-related technologies with Israel, you know, being one of the, the best places for technologies around water. So there are a bunch of things that um, it's almost a mirror image of what we're seeing in Israel uh, that was developed in Israel that they're looking for. And I think that, uh, and, and we heard this, they really want to do business. And the, it, it looked almost as if they're more thrilled than we were. And I can tell you, we were very thrilled. So it was a tough competition on who's more excited. And I'm joining Michael, they all, you know, say how they want to come to Tel Aviv and they want to be in Jerusalem. And they're literally sitting on their um, suitcases waiting for the flights to start going between the country. Tourism will go both ways, I believe. Uh, so overall, you know, it's, it's huge. It's, I can't even ex explain how big, you know, it, it seems to be. Great. It sounds, uh, sounds like uh, it's the beginning of a, a beautiful friendship or partnership between the two countries. Um, I want to turn to our audience uh, Q&A right now, but first, before I do it, I did promise that we were we would touch on uh, your reviewer, your moonshot, Space IL, and, um, and talk a little bit about what your next mission is going to look like. So tell us about what Space IL was all about and, uh, and, and where you're headed next. So when we started uh, Space Air, we realized that it's, it's more than just a moon mission. Uh, we realized that Space Air is actually a, a tool that can be used to impact a generation. And we think we've, we've managed to do that with our educational programs in Israel and the diaspora. And now we're starting to work on our second spacecraft. We still ha haven't unveiled the, uh, the design, the, uh, the mission. But I could tell that it's, you know, we're Israeli, so if you fail once, you're going to try even harder. So it's going to be an exciting mission. And I, of course, uh, invite you, uh, if you, you want to take part in the mission, to, uh, you can email me to yariv at spacehell.com or contact us on our Facebook page or website and, and be part of that. We're currently actually uh, looking for the, uh, the next uh, figure to lead the... Uh, the funding for Space IL, it's uh, not an easy task, especially during uh, COVID-19, but it's, uh, it's going to be fun. Great. All right, let's, let's take some questions uh, from the audience right now. Um, we'll start with this one. In the era of COVID, what should we have been doing technologically and medically to address this crisis better through diagnostic tests, therapeutics, Etc. What have we learned to be better prepared for the future? I think you thought you're probably best to answer that one. Yeah. So, so what we've seen, and this is again uh, things that were government enticed. Um, there are a few calls for companies that think they could be helpful in all kinds of things that relate to COVID. So, 
monitoring and diagnostics of, of the virus, et cetera, to come and, and bid for uh, grants. Um, I was told that 300 companies <laughs> out of the blue came up with all kinds of things. Uh, I'm hearing of various uh, companies that are close to having uh, or have something that, that is a faster diagnosis. Uh, obviously, we have some Israeli you know, related uh, people around the drug companies that are developing, you know, the, uh, hopefully to come, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, vaccines. Uh, vaccines, sorry, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So there is a lot being done. Uh, to be honest with you, it's a good question of what from all of those attempts is going to sustain post, uh, you know, the vaccine. So once there will be a vaccine, some of those companies are going to go back to where they were before, just like, like I told you before, the pivoting in Israeli startups is something that is a, a, it's a phenomenon. Uh, but, but there is a lot of, of the, uh, work being done. And um, uh, fortunately also there's uh, money around uh, investing in those startups uh, amongst the uh, uh, healthcare related investors. There are a few new funds here uh, who are investing. So, so it looks good. How do you see the issues of privacy, privacy impacting or curtailing development in tech? Michael, are you able to take that one? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, there's obviously been a lot of attention paid to privacy in the last few years in a whole new regulatory scheme in the EU that uh, companies have had to, um, uh, to deal with. And, um, you know, I, I, I think um, that, uh, you, you know, there, there, there are a lot of different moving parts. Obviously, there's a demographic aspect to it because the younger people seem to have uh, less concern about privacy than uh, the older generations. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I think as um, technology um, makes privacy uh, more difficult, um, new technologies can come back and make privacy easier again. And I think uh, we're sort of seeing that that cycle uh, begin in, in a lot of things, including uh, in some of the vehicle communications companies that, that we're involved in. This one's for you. How do we manage drone traffic for the, for the future with air traffic? So we're actually now working on that with the FAA. It's a, a balance of a traffic management system that will be able to uh, negotiate and uh, you know, divert traffic between cooperative airplanes and drones and the detect and avoid system that will be able to detect uncooperative airplanes or other drones that are up there. So this is work in progress. We are part of those groups working with the FAA and I expect us to start, you know, once we have so many drones in the air, that's gonna be a great problem. It means that we're, you know, we're already uh, doing lots of deliveries and I expect that by the end of next year, we'll see some initial solutions. I think we have time for one, one last question and I'm gonna ask it to all three of you. Um, if you were betting people or investors, let's say, what are some of the um, lesser known sectors coming out of Israeli high tech that we should be looking out for, or perhaps thinking to put our money into? Michael, let's start with you. Well, you know, I'm uh, pretty narrowly focused in, in mobility, which is, is a pretty broad sector, but um, I, I still probably don't don't see some of the really uh, funky things in, in in other in other sectors, but um, uh, we've seen um, uh, a lot of interesting uh, technologists within mobility. Um, I talked before about micro mobility vehicles and electric uh, scooters, electric bicycles, and so forth. And um, you know, autonomy is um, uh, another theme that that we've invested in usually around cars, but uh, a lot of uh, companies are looking now at, you know, what if the uh, scooter could come to you? Um, and so, so you don't have to go out, go out and find, find a scooter or scooters could rebalance themselves into um, areas that are, are he more heavily trafficked to, for, for more common use. So I, I think um, the combination of uh, uh, electric autonomous technologies and all form factors of vehicles uh, are gonna continue to perpetuate themselves. But there's a good one to go on. Yeah, so, so the, the usual suspects of cyber and AI, I think, uh, 
you know, you guys in the States have already heard about it. Um, I think two, there are two exciting things. One is food technology, which I believe Israel is gaining a uh, huge momentum and, and is becoming a, a real player on, on the global map. Uh, so that's one. The other one, again, endorsed by uh, the government deeply, uh, which, which relates to uh, this, this multidisciplinary theme of Israeli startups. Uh, and it's around uh, what's called uh, bioconvergence, which is, you know, biology mixed with whatever physics or, or anything else. Uh, and I, I don't know who asked the questions about medical uh, stuff, but this is going to be the next revolution of, you know, drug uh, uh, discovery and other things that relate to healthcare, things that have to do with uh, genes. I think that this is something that is going to be a platform that will be able to allow us to have a next generation, you know, massive number of companies that will create, you know, a, a sector of, its, of itself uh, and attract potentially uh, new, new types of money uh, to be invested and, and have a whole new sector uh, coming up out of Israel. Nareem, if you were investing in drone technology or space technology, where would you be putting your money? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm, uh, I'm also here, again, with aerospace. So in, when it comes to drones, there are a few uh, interesting agriculture-focused drone companies that are meant uh, to survey fields and uh, crops. And that's a very interesting uh, market that's only now just beginning. So there are already a few Israeli companies doing that. And that's pretty cool. When it comes to space, you have a few uh, space-based uh, 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 startups in Israel, uh, and they're doing quite well as well. So these are two, again, smaller markets, but it looks like the uh, Israel has the know-how, and we'll be able to expand on those uh, on those markets as we uh, move forward. Thank you very much. That, um, th that more or less brings us to the end of, of uh, today's discussion. But again, we are going to have um, a series of these kinds of discussion um, insider look into the Israeli innovation ecosystem. So I just want to reiterate that if you have suggestions for future events, um, please send them into the, uh, the Zoom Q&A function. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Yariv, Michael, and Yifat for sharing your amazing insights into the Israeli innovation ecosystem, where it's been and where it's heading. I also want to thank the people at Impact Israel for putting this panel together, to Eric Schwartz for his moving introduction, to my close friend and Impact Israel strategic consultant, Danny Ripps, and to Liz Klavanoff, Impact Israel's senior director of development for their work putting this event together. The work of their Israeli partners in the Yamin Or Youth Village and the Village Way Educational Initiatives is truly groundbreaking and its success lifting the lives of Israel's most vulnerable at-risk youth. And now it's my pleasure to hand off to Liz Klapmanoff for some final words. Thank you, John, and thank you to our extraordinary panelists. John, thank you for being an amazing moderator. Yariv, Michael, and Yifat, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a little bit of insight into what is going on in the tech sector. I know that all of us watching felt privileged to be able to be in on the conversation about what's going on. And I really think that this is an opportunity for us to see something that we never get to see every single day, to work with people that are doing good for Israel with technology and innovation. And on behalf of the Board of Impact of Israel and my executive director, Karen Salison, thank you so much for joining. You know, just to connect the dots for a second, we at Impact Israel have the privilege and opportunity to, as you saw, transform and impact the lives of over 22,000 children through education and through our ability to lift them up on a daily basis. Uh, the challenges are great during Corona, but the challenges are there every single day. Um, but it's our calling and it is our privilege. So. I really wanna thank everybody for giving us this opportunity to do that. Our goal is to not only enrich these kids, but to really create a better society for all of Israel. Um, and I think uh, looking at society around the world, we have to do that everywhere. So I'm sure we all agree that's a lofty goal for us. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I, let me take, you, take the opportunity to wish you a happy new year. Um, and yes, we will be having more of these kinds of webinars. So stay tuned and please give us your feedback, what you'd like to hear. And I really want to wish you a happy new year and stay safe. So thanks for joining us.